at a meeting of the Amherst School Committee at 6.03 p.m. on Tuesday, March 30th. Um, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed um, on Amherst Media on Channel 15 and on the website. Um, we will begin with roll call attendance. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. I uh, don't think we had minutes in our packet, even though it's on our agenda. So we will skip over the next item and move on to public comment. Um, we have some voice comment as well as some uh, written comment. I'll start with the voice comment. This um, first comment, um, uh, the commenter uh, submitted two voice messages as well as a written messages. So I'm going to play the three minutes of the voice message and then just alert everybody that the, that the written comment is also available and I believe it's posted online. Kathleen Trapagan and I live in Amherst. Thank you for taking comments. Dear Amherst School Committee, I was distressed to learn that the administration is again setting their sights on art teachers. Eight years after almost the same budget cuts compelled me to run for school committee. It's as if the administration learned nothing after cutting the special teachers in 2013 and then restoring the cuts in 2015. So many platitudes at that time about the value of arts education special teachers and the important role of arts integration. Now we find ourselves in 2021 with deja vu. I read that since the arts and technology staff at Crocker Farm are leaving and retiring, rather than replace them with full-time staff, the district is proposing to hire part-time staff to teach two days per week at Crocker Farm and have the Wildwood and Fort River art and technology teachers cover the other two days. Students will still receive 40 minute class each week in both subjects, but the reductions would mean that the specialist teachers will condense their classes into four days a week in each school, leaving less time for other projects or integrated programming that crosses disciplines. Well, here's what I wrote to the bulletin in 2013 before I ran for school committee. Joy and mastery in music and art leads many students who are otherwise struggling in the classroom environment to deeper engagement in school and the development of the 21st century skills such as perseverance, goal setting and executive functioning that research is increasingly revealing are at the foundation of academic success. All parents and caregivers can take pride in watching their children perform or seeing their art pieces displayed on the walls of the school. Class, race, and language barriers are reduced through chorus, band, orchestra, visual art shows, and activities such as jump rope club. This does not happen by accident. This is not magic. This is the result of hard work on the part of the special teachers. These teachers are integral members of our school communities. Their impact is not confined to 40 minute instructional time slots. Unlike grade level teachers, their relationships with children and families span across years. They understand the developmental trajectory of the children and build a multi-year relationship with families. They provide a valuable perspective on children's strengths and learning styles that informs all the adults in the children's lives. They support the classroom teachers in integrating music and arts into the curricula, further sparking student engagement and helping to make up for the woefully inadequate time for the arts in the weekly schedule. The special teachers in our schools play a vital connecting role and bring a positive energy to the entire school community, energy that fuels student and adult engagement alike. This takes real time and a presence in the school to achieve. Treating this job as if the teachers were vendors. As mentioned, this um, the full comment is available in the packet that's posted. Hi, this is Amber Connell Martin. I am a resident of Amherst. I have two children. I have a 10 year old who's a fourth grader at Wildwood and I have a child who's entering kindergarten in the fall. I'm calling to express a couple of concerns to you today. Um, first of all, COVID safety concerns about returning to school. Um, a really big concern that I have is around notification of families if there's a positive COVID case in the building. Um, I think that notification should be automatic whether or not the child is considered to have been in close contact 
with the person who tested positive, whether or not my child has been. Um, I think that's really important. Um, another thing about safety is um, I'm concerned about children being allowed to play outside with no mask on because I know elementary school children and I don't think we can trust them to always stay six feet away. Um, my kids are used to wearing masks. Um, they can keep wearing masks. They play outside with other kids wearing masks um, that aren't from our pod to stay safe and I think they can continue to do that. Um, I don't think that masks should be allowed to come off in classrooms at all. Um, I hope that that can be guaranteed. I don't feel like that's safe. Um, and then secondly, I just want to talk about my budget concerns a little bit. Um, I am very concerned about some budget cuts that are going to be happening according to the budget that I've seen. Um, the first thing are the cuts that will affect bilingual families. Um, my family is bilingual, Spanish and English. Um, so it would eventually um, impact us, if not now. Um, so my concern is about the elimination of the bilingual psychologist um, position as well as the ELL interpreters. Um, I think those are really important positions and I think funding should be found for them. And my other concern is about a budget cut that was proposed for the elementary school to reduce art and tech from five to four days per week. Um, to save really what I think is a little bit of money, um, I think arts and specials are really important. It's one of the few things that I've kept my kids going through this really hard pandemic year. Um, he loves being able to do the specials much. Um, he loves the attention. So if you're trying to stretch these teachers over a couple of schools, they're not going to have time to prep. They're going to be rushed all the time. Um, I think that it's going to be it's going to shortchange our children and it shortchanges the teachers. Um, and I don't think that's fair. So I think money should also be found um, from other line items to continue to fund the special. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Hi, my name is Roseanne Heldon, H-E-L-D-E-N, 516-967-4456. I am calling in hopes that you will not take away the $75,000 needed to have the full-time arts and technology teacher at Crocker Farm. I have grandchild who goes there, and this would be a great loss. Um, why don't you allow the public to vote on an override? And um, I'm sure many of us would be very willing to add a little to our taxes to make sure our kids have a good education. Thank you. My name is Laura Muller, and I am a parent for Wildwood third grade third, third grader. At Wildwood, the A team, as the special teachers have branded themselves, have provided an amazing array of learning opportunities for our children beginning last March when they started weekly A team challenges to get the students using their imaginations, moving their bodies, and creating art. When the students went back to having their regular specials rotation and distance learning model, parents could hear how much the A team is just that, A team. Ms. Cara, Ms. Catherine, Mrs. Well, Mr. B, and Catherine Music work together so the thinking they ask students to do overlaps and their work with classroom teachers uses and enhances student math and literacy skills. And of course, this dedicated group of teachers has also helped our students figure out ways to express and to process their feelings safely. I am sure it is the same at Fort River and Crocker Farm. The proposed budget cut asking for the elimination of one elementary technology specialist and one art teacher in the district, thereby asking the remaining two to divide their time between two schools is a bad idea. In my example, Ms. Cara and Ms. Catherine would have reduced time at each school. Not only will these teachers lose prep time, they will lose valuable time for meeting together and with the classroom teachers about what the students are learning and how to integrate art and technology into those lessons. Research shows that students learn more fully when their learning is authentic integration of topics and skills across the curriculum rather than discrete events is one way to do that. I oppose the budget cuts to the elementary school art and technology curriculum. $75,000 is not very much in a $24 million budget. Elementary students need and deserve curricular integration of art and technology in the same way that library, music, and PE are integrated. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Page and I live in Amherst. I'm asking you to please restore the funds needed to prevent the reductions to the art and technology specials at the elementary schools. First, these two areas are needed now more than ever. 
Art is one of the things that makes life worth living, especially in these dark times. And at a time when people are connecting via technology more than ever, technology is essential to students' lives and will be a vital part of their futures. Second, all elementary children will suffer due to these cuts. Wildwood and Fort River students will lose out on things like arts integration because the, the two special teachers at each of those schools will be spending part of their time at Crocker Farms instead of at their home school. And Crocker Farms students will have a mishmash of special teachers and will lose out on two full-time teachers who can get to know them over their years at Crocker Farms, in addition to losing out on arts integration like their Wildwood and Fort River peers. Third, this changes two full-time teaching positions into two part-time positions, which will surely have higher turnover, because when you're working a 40% job, you have to also work another job, or you have, you're, you're keeping an eye out for something full-time. This is an equity issue that disproportionately harms Crocker Farm students, while also causing harm to Wildwood and Fort River students, simply because those two positions happen to be vacating at Crocker Farm. With a $24 million elementary school budget, surely you can find the $75,000 needed to prevent this harm from occurring. Thank you. Okay, and now I will share my screen to share the written comment. Um, the written comment, if it's not posted already on the Amherst School Committee um, uh, agendas page, it will be um, very soon. Are folks seeing my screen, the public comment document? I can't see folks. Uh, yes? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. I'm going to scroll quickly. This is the text of the comment that was uh, called it, uh, recorded as a voice message as well. This comment was also recorded as a voice message.
Um, and as I mentioned, that document um, is posted on the Amherst School Committee agenda's webpage. Um, moving on to our next item, we have the superintendent's update. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Morris. I'll really be brief today. I know I've been working on this, but today I will be successful at brevity. Um, so I only have two updates. Uh, and one, both good news updates. One is the Fort River screen principal uh, search committee. The screening part of that has done their work. They've recommended a high number of candidates for semifinalist interviews, uh, which are happening within the next week and a half. Um, and that's good because they recommend candidates who um, are worth interviewing and, you know, with electronic applications, you never know the, the raw number of applicants sometimes uh, if you can click a button and apply for a job, you can end up getting applicants uh, that add to your quantity, but don't add to the real pool. And in this case, uh, the screening committee felt very excited about many candidates. So the interview committee has a lot of work to do because they have a lot of people to interview, uh, but that's a good problem. So we'll keep the committee and the community updated as that happens. Uh, as, a, as an aside or a, a summary, uh, the screening committee will, is, work is done. The interview committee will interview a number of candidates. They'll recommend uh, a small number, usually around three um, to me, uh, for me to vet. And then uh, when we get to the finalist stage, we'll bring them uh, virtually to be able to meet the community, gather lots of feedback and input from any member of the public, the Fort River community who would like, and then we'll communicate the selection for someone to start um, July 1st. I want to acknowledge that this, that person has large shoes to fill and thank, you know, Diane Chamberlain. She's, she's here through the end of the year and working really hard, but I just want to acknowledge her work uh, over many years in the district, actually districts. Um, she's worked at the regional level as well. So that's my Fort River principal search update. My only other update is that our sixth grade uh, staff members with Tim Sheehan and Jen Reese involved uh, have been awarded $15,000 in grant funding. Uh, over the next three years to be in the initial cohort of schools in Massachusetts, adopting the cutting edge middle school, because it's sixth grade, it's, it's their middle school, middle school open side core science curriculum. Um, and it's a, what's called a phenomenon based curriculum. So that's kind of a, a different way to say project based learning where we're working with real materials, real applications um, and learning by doing instead of learning by sort of textbook or um, that sort of thing. So we're really thrilled to be working with the 1-8 Foundation and the Mass STEM Hub because they're the kind of organizers of this. And um, so they have uh, awards uh, for the next three years. Um, so that's exciting. Oh, I do have a third update. Uh, for some reason it didn't come through, uh, but it's also a good news update, which is that we got a, a sizable grant uh, to continue uh, as Caminantes grows uh, from the Department of Education uh, in Massachusetts for additional work on curriculum uh, instruction and design as we go up another grade level next year to second grade and expand to um, three grade levels. So that was uh, welcome. Uh, we also are trying to look if we can provide some additional summer programming because it, we know it's hard to learn um, two languages virtually and that's the condition that most of our students have been in for most of the year in Caminante. So we are exploring whether we can use some of those funds also to perhaps a little, perhaps extend the year a little bit because of the, the in, specific challenge that students faced in Caminantes this year being remote for much of the year. But those are my three updates. And that was, I think, as brief as I've been in quite some time. So there may be questions, but um, I'm not responsible for the length or duration of those. Questions? Mr. Demling. Well, I'm responsible for the length of my question. Um, how much was the grant for, com for the Caminantes program? So that's what I had it in my document and it went away, but it's, it's, it's a lot. I think it's in the order of magnitude of over $200,000, but I will, by the time, if the chair has an update, I will be able to pull it. Uh, Ms. Spitzer may have it uh, quicker than myself, but I have it on my notes for this meeting. And I think I unfortunately deleted that section, but I think Ms. Spitzer will be able to give us the answer. Um, 237,000, uh, 237,240 dollars. 237,240, sorry. <laughs> I, I was looking at it too because I, I, I was. I'll let Peter finish his line of questioning. <laughs> Mr. Demling, did you have more questions? No. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments, Ms. Spitzer? No, I, I'm so happy to hear that we've got the grant funding. Um, I, I have a question. Is it for one year that the that the funding's for? Is it spread out over multiple years? It's one. It's, it's the same grant we've gotten the last couple years, and we didn't. I mean, honestly, with with the pandemic and the budgeting uh, at the state level, we didn't know if it was gonna be there. 
Um, it's happening at a different time than it typically did, but this is going to help us with um, supporting our staff members to get the bilingual endorsement through the partnership we have with the university and the Holyoke Public Schools, uh, help us with curriculum development and curriculum materials. And again, we're hoping that we can put something together to support the continued acquisition of two languages for our young students at, uh, who are within the Commonwealth Days program. But um, it, it's, it, we did not, I mean, we were, that's what we applied for. You always apply for a grant and you don't know if you're going to necessarily get the full amount you apply for. Um, so, you know, many kudos to Kitty Richardson, our ELL coordinator for uh, her work, uh, as well as the staff's work to put together a grant application that was highly respected and responded to by uh, folks at DESE. So, you know, really, really happy uh, to get the full amount we asked for and the full amount allowable given the size of our district. And um, we're going to put it to good use. Um, any other questions? Seeing none. Um, I actually don't have a chair's update tonight. Um, I'll uh, save any comments for when we are um, talking about the budget later on. Um, are there any school committee announcements? Seeing none. Okay. Uh, so we will move on now to um, our new and continuing business. And our first item is the FY22 budget discussion and vote. Um, and for folks that are watching, we had um, our uh, a first look at um, detailed ads and cuts two weeks ago at our school at our budget hearing. Um, and since then, the line by line item uh, budget, full budget document was posted and published on Friday. Um, and uh, so tonight we're going to continue conversations on, on the budget. And we did ask questions two weeks ago about those, uh, the cuts that we heard a lot about in the, in the public comment this evening. Um, and I think we have, we have some sort of clarification and explanations on, on a little bit more detail on those, um, but we're going to be continuing our discussion tonight um, and trying to come to a vote. So I think maybe um, since, you know, the line by line budget there so that Dr. Slaughter's here if there's any questions, but maybe since a lot of the feedback was on page 39 or 41 of the packet, which was the ads cuts, uh, the committee's okay. Maybe I'll uh, review the ads cuts list and see if there's questions on that and we can loop back to anything on the line item budget if there's a question. Would that be That's agreeable? Cool. That sounds great. Okay. So, um, and I apologize, some of this I'm saying again, but since some of the public comment perhaps, you know, I either, you know, wasn't able to tune in or didn't, I didn't do it clearly enough the last time I'm going to uh, describe that. So, um, the sabbatical, we didn't have any sabbatical requests, contractually reserve a spot for a sabbatical each year for a staff member, uh, says so $30,000 in adjustments and the turnover savings is that we have some retiring staff and when we do, we can assume that some of the folks who are coming in will come in at a lower um, pay grade. Um, so that's what the turnover savings uh, indicates. Um, yep, uh, thank you. I'm happy to do that. Oh, looking funny on my screen. Um, can folks see that? Okay. Yep. Um, I can try to zoom a little bit. And just to remind this, the uh, public as well as the committee that this is not a balanced budget. So it's a cut of $372,000. We are using more choice than we anticipate coming in. Uh, and we did this to prevent further cuts in a year where we've had um, so many challenges as have, as have many districts due to the pandemic. Um, but this is not a budget that's balanced. It's an imbalanced budget um, and it's not a sustainable budget that way. At some point, we're gonna have to only spend the amount of choice money that we have coming in. So now we'll get to the budget reduction. So um, we do anticipate at the regular education that we will be able to reduce one classroom teacher with the reduced enrollment. Um, we don't exactly know where that'll be because of the uncertainty of the enrollments as it stands now, but we would have anticipated that sans pandemic, just looking at the number of kids in each cohort, uh, the graduating kids, the incoming kindergartners, uh, we would anticipate being able to reduce a section um, Regardless, so as our numbers come in, in the later in the spring, we will make that adjustment. 
There's a special ed teacher cut at Fort River. Um, a couple years ago, we added a special education teacher at Fort River when Comenantes was coming in, and that was because we needed a bilingual special educator um, to be part of that program as well as part of the school. And we didn't have anyone on staff at Fort River who could fill that need. Um, and the idea was that that was going to be a temporary ad, that at the point at which Comenantes was covering a couple grade levels, we would be reducing that special ed teacher to make it line up evenly with the other schools. Well, now it'd be at, you know, 40 some odd, about 40% of the school uh, will have a grade level with Comenantes in it. So we can make that reduction and keep it in line with the other schools. Again, Comenantes would intend it to be, I know we just got this big large grant, but it was intended to be from the operating budget as budget neutral as possible or budget neutral. And, and so we had a short term cost uh, associated with the introduction of the program, but we're trying to com commit to the budget neutral language that we spoke about when the language, when the program started. Um, Next two were the specials, so there was a lot of public comment about that. So I want to share a couple pieces of information. Um, so I think there was a number of comments that talked about, um, public comments that talked about, you know, seven years ago or eight years ago. I think this is really about some of the other reductions as well, that we have fewer students in our school. This is not a cut targeting art or technology uh, in any way. This is that, you know, compared to then, we have about 18% less, fewer students in the Amherst Public Schools uh, than we did at that point. And, you know, one of the things that we've heard on uh, from different voices about budget um, consistency and sustainability is that we have to look at making reductions when we can based on the reduction in students in our enrollment. Um, this is not about our enrollment staying the same and we're going to uh, reduce the amount of art and technology students have. It'll actually be per capita pretty much the same as it was seven or eight years ago uh, when the specials were restored to full time. I think the second thing I want to share is that all of our specialist teachers every day uh, will have a block for their prep um, and then also an integration block, even with this reduction. And that's really just because of the declining enrollment, um, that there still will be integration time in all schools, in all areas. I want to acknowledge that it'll be reduced from what it, what it is this moment. Uh, it'll look a lot more like what it was eight years ago uh, when we had about 20 percent less students uh, in our schools. Um, and so I think it is worth noting that this is really about the enrollment decline and not about any particular um, devaluation of art or technology. Art and technology teachers are fabulous. Uh, we know they're fabulous. We know this is a hard conversation. If we were a district that was adding students, we'd be having a different conversation about the potential implications, but that's not been our reality uh, for, for many years. I think the other thing uh, to clarify is that um, from an individual student perspective, they will have the same art and technology teacher all year long. Um, it won't be like one week it's Mr. Demling, the next week it's Mr. Harrington and the AB schedule or something that you might see at a high school with um, that. It's that this, the students will be able to build the relationship with their teacher in each special all year long and that won't, that won't change with this change, with this um, reduction if it, if it goes through. Um, and I think it's um, I think it's worth noting, and, and I try not to do this because I don't like comparing staff members, that um, we incredibly value the arts and technology and the other specials in our district. Um, they tend to get integration time and, and in addition to their prep that lots of our teachers would be able to do wonderful things with, uh, but we don't give them the opportunity. Our special education teachers who have both special education students to teach IEPs to write, evaluations to complete, they, they would do great with an extra prep time as well. Our classroom teachers certainly would benefit if they had additional integration time. Um, and it's only because of our valuing of art and music and technology teachers that they do have this opportunity for integration and they do amazing things with it. Um, but I do think just, you know, there's lots of people who would benefit from more integration time. Um, in our schools, we, we give it to arts folks for good reason um, and they will still have it in, even with this budget reduction. And, and I think this is where it really gets a, a little bit hard in the conversation. If we don't want to make reductions based on declining enrollment, then we're going to need to ask the town for a lot more money each year for our budgets. Because um, the reality is our, our enrollment is going down. And I think unless we're in a situation where the town is going to fund us three and a half, four percent more each year, we do have to look at declining enrollments. We've made, you know, significant cuts, for instance, at central office over the last few years, um, because we needed to, and we had declining enrollment, we were able to make some reductions that we were able to make as our, as our district contracted. Um, and so that's, I think, where the rub is, is that 
um, it's really about class size, excuse me, it's about school size and enrollment size, not about any specific area. I think in this particular instance, it did also resolve a situation where we were able to make some reductions without riffing our staff. And I think I was pretty clear in this district and other districts that one of our priorities was to keep our talented staff members on our payroll uh, without a reduction whenever possible. It wasn't possible across the board, uh, but whenever possible. And all the other reductions we would have looked at um, to, to finish getting to our number would have reduced, would have had a reduction in force, would have involved either some staff losing their position or becoming part-time in our school. And I don't want to pretend that that did not go into our thinking, that we were trying to retain as many of our talented staff members as we can. It's not the only decision. Obviously, we're thinking about kids, um, but we're also thinking about our adults as well. Um, fiscally, it benefits our district in terms of unemployment, uh, and Doug could answer any questions you have about that. Um, but this was a hard decision, but I really want to clarify it's not about art and, and technology in specific. Uh, the main theme would be that uh, our teachers will still have integration time throughout the week. Students will still have the same teachers throughout the week. Students will still have the benefit of being able to um, see arts integration happen. Um, and it's really based on declining enrollment. We've made cuts over the years in other areas based on declining enrollment as well. And uh, it's hard to kind of process and, and think about which cuts to make uh, as we look at declining enrollment, but this is one we haven't made. And you know, given the fiscal situation as well as the enrollment, we felt like we needed to, to go down this road. Um, I've said a lot, I know I've got more um, things to describe, but I think I'm halfway down the cut list. So maybe that would be an opportune time to pause and see if there's questions or comments from the committee. And, and if, if folks are okay, I'm, I, I'm wondering if it might make more sense to just oh. continue to go through because I think some of the questions are about, at least that I might have, are about sort of the choices and prioritization of the cuts. And so it might be helpful to go through it all. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep going. Um, so uh, facilities, I think we spoke about this uh, last time that we do have some unfilled positions that have been posted for quite some time. Um, and we've been able to cobble together some contractors in our area to make sure that the work is continuing to happen. I think rightfully some committee members last time, you know, had a question about whether this is a long-term viable plan and, you know, probably not. Um, but I think we, can we get through next year and uh, see what our systems look like and, and maybe a little bit less in the pandemic, hopefully, and reorganize and see what our needs are. I think, I think we can do that next year and I think we can do it effectively. Um, that's a testament to our larger facilities crew who's figured out how to take on some broader sort of management of consultants because that's the challenge with consultants is that you know you're managing their time instead of them being employees but you know many thanks to people who are making that work Mr. Roy Clark and his team as well. Uh, food service we have a food service assistant um, position that's vacant and again going back to the retaining our staff this was a, a reduction we thought we'd be able to make um, and, and continue to move forward with our food service and school nutrition program. Uh, the bilingual psychologist to clarify this is uh, a position that we've had posted for about a year and a half uh, we've not found any viable candidates unfortunately it is not a direct service position for students it's a an evaluation position so when we have students who are bilingual and there needs to be an evaluation about their academic or psychological um, strengths and challenges. This is someone who can perform that task in both English and Spanish. We have been contracting uh, with someone to be able to complete this. That's gone smoothly. We'd rather have someone on our staff, um, but at the time, you know, it can be on an as needed basis, but this does not at all reduce direct service to students uh, in the least. Um, reception position in central office, this will be a bit of a challenge, especially if we start opening up um, to visitors. Um, so it may keep us a little more closed off, but I think we'll probably be a little close to visitors for some time moving forward, even as students go into the building. Um, but again, it's trying to see where we could reduce uh, as best we could. And the last one is an interpreter uh, reduction. And this was recommended by uh, an outside expert who looked at our ELL program, noticed that we had many, many more interpreters than other comparison districts, and a concern was expressed about how long our students who are acquiring English are relying on interpreters and not actually receiving instruction from teachers. Um, you know, and she recommended that uh, we condense a bit of that work um, in terms of best practices and supporting English language learners. Um, so this is a cut reflective of the recommendation uh, that we, we, we um, had last year. 
It happened. The report was filed like beginning of pandemic, so I know it wasn't like high on people's radar, um, but it was the 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 person was in our buildings, uh, visited our ELL classrooms, had tremendously positive things to say about much of the work of our ELL department, but this is one area where um, she, she looked at us compared to other districts with similar ELL populations and noticed a real imbalance and expressed a pretty significant concern. All for the, gosh, this, none of this is a critique of interpreters, it's about us and how we structure the educational environment for students. So that's the rundown. I think I got everything uh, on the cuts list. I wanna say this is really hard, it's really painful. If there was, uh, if, if, if we were not at a, if we were at a different budget level, we'd be having a happier conversation and a very different conversation. Um, but we're trying to balance the fiscal responsibility the town is asking for us um, and declining enrollment and um, the competing needs that we have to come up with recommendations for you all. But I'm open to any comments or questions that you might have. Questions? <laughs> Ms. Spitzer, it was a, it was a little competition there who would raise their hand first. <laughs> Yes, okay. This time I want. Um, I, I guess it's not so much a question because I think you've done a good job of explaining the the cuts. It, but it's hard. I think you know everything you said is true about this not being easy. Like it's never easy to cut from the budget. Um, so, and I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase this. But I, and I've expressed some of this to you, and I think I've said this before. Um, you know, I think one of the tricky things as a school committee member, and I'm assuming also for some members of the public, is that we see um, the cuts to the operating budget and at the same time we're also aware of funds that are potentially coming into the district from other sources. And I I understand now, I feel like better than I, than I had in the past, the reasons, you know, we don't necessarily see the stimulus funds or the CARES Act funds, you know, sh stimulus isn't the right, but the CARES Act funds, you know, coming through and, and adjusting the budget. But I think the challenges that we're only seeing in a year like this year, where there are major funds coming from outside sources, outside of the, the operating budget, that will actually have an impact on what's happening in the classrooms and what we're able to offer. It's it's tricky um, because I'm, I'm not happy about making these cuts but the way you're explaining them i, I feel I, i'm never gonna say feel good about it but i don't feel like our students are gonna have um a serious um losses as a result i think we'll continue to hopefully provide um education and and the other services that we provide uh, well but i think it's we're only i guess what i'm arguing for is that if there's a way then in the future that we can have a report on how what grant funding is coming in how it's going to be used and kind of flush out more broadly what's going to be happening because i keep saying this i'm a broken record now but next year i anticipate that even if we experience declining enrollment because of what's happening with the pandemic and the way that education and um, delivery of education is shifting that we may actually have more needs than than we have in the past and and it's hard to see i think especially from the public public if we're cutting all this money out how are we going to cover what we anticipate are actually going to be greater needs for the students so when they see a psychologist cut it it's really worrisome because we know that we're going to have kids who are dealing with trauma and 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 um, dealing with other issues and when i see a cut to food service assistant and i know that we're probably going to be delivering food in a totally new way um in as we are starting to in person it makes me really concerned about that um and i'm also you know i'm when i saw the cuts initially to technology and arts my initial reaction was also this we should find a way to find that seventy five thousand dollars and put it back in now after your explanation this evening I'm, I'm feeling less um less concerned about that cut and more concerned actually about the overall trend of declining enrollment so i'm going to stop with one more kind of comment which i think is you know, we had that enrollment working group a while back. I'm, I'm curious, um, and we don't need to talk about this in depth tonight, but if, if, it, if there's a need to start thinking more long term about these implications, because through the JCPC meetings that we'll talk about later and through all of these other conversations that I've been having outside of just this meeting, I'm concerned about the trend we're seeing. And I don't know if there's any long term planning that needs to go into thinking about how we're going to um, continue to kind of deal with 
rather than dealing with it on an annual basis, if there's any long-term planning we can do to think about how we're gonna deal with if, if these trends continue on a more longer-term basis. So that was a very long comment, thank you. Dr. Morris. Yeah, so I think I think you're right, you know, and we can come back and talk about grants, but I do think uh, what I wanna acknowledge in your comment and be more specific in my response is that we do have areas that are not gonna be funded in this appropriated budget that we need to take care of next year. And that's where really we need to lean on grants. So I'll give you a couple, for instance, from a health and safety perspective, we have gyms at all three elementary schools that will need significant ventilation work this summer uh, to be ready to go, or you know, different air purification systems to be ready to go for fall. Because I imagine we, we're not gonna be in the same environment where we never use gyms. Um, the Crocker Farm cafeteria is the same. Um, these are very real costs that we'll have to look for grant funding for. Um, one of the things that's interesting that I found out this week, and I'll be on a webinar with Mr. Sheehan next week, is that DESE is opening up if we want to apply for, and they had this pre-pandemic, having a remote academy. Um, I, I actually do think there's probably enough families who are interested in continuing in some level of remote. Um, at least there's enough that are telling me that, that it's something that we should explore, and there's a financial element if we wanna go down a road. I'm just mentioning these as possibilities, I'm not making commitments, but I just, I think it's worth, you're raising a really good point about, we're gonna have pandemic related needs and, and what are some of those? So I think I just wanna highlight them because I think that's relevant to the discussion. You know, I think you're right on the mental health piece um, and we've had some initial conversations on how we might access um, some of the grant fundings for additional case manager uh, types of work that we know that the needs are greater than they were 14 months ago. Uh, and they were still a lot 14 months ago in terms of the needs of, of certain members of our community. Uh, we're gonna need a fair amount of curriculum work, right? What we know, and I don't wanna get into the whole debate of whether learning loss and people argue about semantics. I, I'm, I'm disinterested in that. What we know is that the fall will be different than this fall and it will be different than the fall before that and the before that. And we wanna make sure our teachers have the time and uh, resources they need to effectively teach our students starting in the fall of 2022. 2021, excuse me, that too, but fall of 2021 is what I was referring to. So I think there are these things that are that do need to happen uh, between now and when students come back in the fall, and that's really what we rely on our grant funds for. Um, you know, it's you know that's why we have them because we recognize it's during a pandemic. Um, so I think in coming weeks we can get. Uh, you know, I got an email actually this afternoon from. Uh, Representative McGovern with much more information than I'd received yet about the stimulus. So I'm still processing it. We're still processing it. Um, literally came in, I don't know, an hour or two ago. Um, and that's the first I've seen of the kind of real numbers and some real implications. It'll all get filtered through DESE and we'll have webinars on DESE about acceptable use. Um, and, uh, but I think you're right, the school committee does and the public do need to be in those conversations to understand what the needs are on the facility side and the health side. Are we gonna continue with certified nurses assistance? If we are, that's not budgeted for, right? All of those pieces play into it, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. There's no shortage of, of needs to take care of um, that aren't gonna go away, even if case counts, knock on wood, are significantly different um, four or five months from now. Sorry, it was a long-winded answer, but I think it's a really important question. So I'm glad I could at least uh, throw a little bit of a teaser out and then we'll we'll get to that uh, at a future meeting where you know we can talk about all the grants we come in and, and Dr. Slaughter can organize that in a way where we could have that conversation. Mr. Demling. So uh, yeah, mostly a comment, um, primarily about how I approach budgets, <clears throat> in particular this example of the $75,000 cuts to arts integration. So. Um, it, it just so happens that today is exactly the completion of um, four full years of school committee for me. Um, so it's been between this and the region, eight budgets. And if my count is correct, six of those have had major cuts. Yeah. Like and by major, I mean hundreds of thousands to more than a million. Um, so I've, I've been through this painful process and un unenviably more often than I would, I would like. And um, what I've I, I've, I've come to see as my, my duty, my responsibility as a public servant on school committee, particularly when we are doing what we're doing right now, which is articulating our thinking process towards our decision for the public, um, is, uh, you know, is, is, is to frame these budget decisions as it has to be more than just reacting to the description in the line item. 
you know, because which is, and by the way, I make no apologies for doing that two weeks ago. I like really value the arts and the arts integration experience my children had at uh, our, our elementary schools, and and I don't want to lose that. Um, but but I feel like we have to go deeper than than just you know, do we value the arts or do we, do we value special education teachers? Do we value support for our English language learners and the student experience? Of, of course, we all resoundingly support that. That's never the question. It's um, you know, but with in terms of thinking deliberatively through this process, it's it's about probing further and, and to what extent is is this a cut to truly a cut to level services that impacts the student experience versus what you described, Dr. Morris, as, as declining enrollment driven. And are there other factors? Sometimes there are cuts that aren't directly related to enrollment um, that are about shifts. Um, what's the impact to next year? You know, you discussed that we're already in kind of a dodgy position where we're taking more from school commit on um, school choice. Um, fund than, than we're taking in, which is not a sustainable budget practice. And so, you know, really the only other alternative for a lot of these things would be to take more from school choice, which would make that that choice worse for next year. And that's what's so difficult about budgeting is that it's a zero sum game, right? You have to take from somewhere to get it. Um, and um, I, I advise this level of scrutiny because, and I think this is a really basic but key point for the public to understand, the school committee does not set the budget amount. Like we, 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 this is a request at an elementary level. It's a lot simpler. This is a request to the town of Amherst to approve. Right. And so we, 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 we go through the line items. We talk about this, but ultimately this is a proposal. This is a, we submit it to the town of Amherst and ultimately the town council will vote on the budget. And, and I think at this level of scrutiny and demonstrating this level of scrutiny and that we're serious about making cuts, particularly enrollment driven cuts is important because I think my opinion, it's time for the town to seriously consider committing to level school services for at least the next several years. Um, and we're the elementary district. So I specifically mean, I think it's time for the town council to start having the discussion about whether it is needed and necessary to help our students through this recover from this pandemic um, and, and to commit to level services um, for the next several years. Um, you know, and like we said before, we have cut majorly a couple of years ago. We cut majorly this year, and then we're going to be cutting majorly with this budget. And um, if if we're going to ask for that bleeding to stop, then I feel like the school committee needs to be reasonable in saying that not all cuts are to deep level services. And you know, like you said, a twenty percent enrollment decline in the last eight years um, mean, means that some of these cuts will be enrollment driven. And I, th I think demonstrating that to the town council and saying, you know, we are willing to work with you with declining enrollment. Um, but what I mean, personally, I'm not willing to work with is cutting any significantly deeper into into level services um, for the schools. So that's that's kind of where I come at with with this. I, I, I really appreciate the advocacy from the public about, you know, the valuing of arts and and support for English language learners um, and, and, and all that. But um, I, I feel like it's it's my it's my duty as as a, a a public rep to to articulate you know why we have to make these these hard choices i mean honestly i think we should be adding to central i feel like we need a communications director i feel like in this we're at a real pivot point with enrollment where we want those families to come back they have a lot of choices the private and charter schools are going to be out there spending many thousands of dollars marketing I would love to add, you know, 30, 40 K to a half FTE communications director that we share with the region and start promoting these services while we still have them. Um, but it's not possible. Right. And so I, I in this budget environment. Um, so it's 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 difficult. But again, I think that you have have managed it in order to minimize the, the impact of the student experience. I, I think I want to. Oh, Dr. Slaughter, please you. And just a quick comment, and I think that that uh, the point by Mr. Dimming is well taken relative to sort of seeing these line items on the, on a page like this. Uh, it's it's one of the challenges that that we face in how to present something as complex as the budget and as and as broad reaching as the budget in a way that is sufficiently concise to have a, a reasonable conversation, but at the same time give you a sufficient detail uh, to make your decisions and to, to you know, ask the probing questions and that sort of thing. So I'm I'm. Uh, imploring each of you and, and the public at large, if there are ways in which we can present these types of complex things to you that would be helpful, uh, I'd love to know about how you'd like to see it to, to be um, 
presented in a way that can help uh, articulate the, the circumstances uh, more clearly to, to the public at large. Thanks. I, I sort of connects to a, you know where I where my head was going also with the comment about the reception position at central office and the comment about sort of support in central office. We've cut like in, in, to get where we are today. We've cut a lot of positions and, and um, services at central office. So when you look at we are really sort of to the bone there. And you know when I think about sort of the um, but, you know, some comments and emails that we've gotten over the last couple of weeks to talk about sort of, you know, the timeliness and the details that we've been given and, and, and publicized about the budget. And part of that is driven because of the resources that we have at the at central office and, and, and the work that all of our, your team is doing across three districts um, all, all at once with, with, with just the, the minimal minimum amount of support and, and, um, staff that we need to be doing those things. Um, community members, families, et cetera, coming into the central office next year with less reception services are going to feel that. And, and, and I think you know, the, the choice that we're making is to protect as much as possible student support, student services, mental, the, the core education services at the expense of some of the other things that people sometimes can find frustrating if they, if, if, if they're not. So I think it's important to call that out, that, um, that those are the, some of the choices we made. Um, and I share sort of um, the sentiment that I hear from Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Demling about, I was one that, you know, when we were looking at these ads cuts two weeks ago, was, was really concerned about the impact on, on sort of arts integration and technology integration in, in um, student learning experiences in, in the classroom. Um, and it, it's facilitated the conversation and really digging and digging and understanding the impact on the student experience. And so I am um, uh, pleased is the wrong word. I think you know it's, it's, it still hurts to make cuts, but at the same time, it's not a riff. We're not, you know, nobody's losing their job on, um, at, in, to make this cut and it's not impacting um, the the day to day student experience in the way that they're still going to be able to we're still going to have arts integration um, our our teachers are still going to have the 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 time the prep time to be able to to provide that um, amazing I think I called it special sauce two weeks ago I, I think one of the questions we we talk about as Mr Deming said this is a zero sum game so what are the what are the some of the other potential cuts that you looked at and didn't make in order to get to here because if we if we were to say gosh we really want to keep that this position or that position you know as, as we as my colleagues have pointed out we have to take it from someplace else or go even deeper in deficit spending which doesn't set us up well for future years so what are those you know the either or it's not like Let's just add these back and and go our merry way. What what we'd have to cut someplace else. What are some of the other things that you looked at? Yeah, so we look really holistically, and our budget process starts from that place of of really suggesting. You know, we look at classrooms, and that's why there's one classroom on there that you recognize that's enrollment based. Um, we looked at special ed, and you see the reduction in special education. Um, you know, it's been a particularly rough year uh, for many students, not all, but many students who have um, special needs. And so, you know, uh, we didn't feel like we could cut any further. We do have some students with higher set of needs than we've experienced in the past and, and perhaps need some, aren't a good fit for uh, even our robust set of specialized programs. So there are some additional costs that come from there, but um, that's not, you know, we have to make decisions of the least restrictive environment and that's the law. And that's also ethically what we need to do around special ed. So we didn't, we didn't find any other place to do that, uh, to look there. From an ELL perspective, you see that there is the, the reduction of the tutors as recommended, but we didn't recommend any reductions. We don't really, we're not seeing the same decline in ELL students that we're seeing in the overall student population. And so, you know, when we look there, we didn't, we didn't feel like we could keep the same level of programming with English language learners. Um, we then looked at, and I think I spoke a little bit in, in terms, different terms last week, but we looked at intervention staff, um, you know, folks who are teaching math and literacy, uh, for struggling students and 
at the end, uh, we had a conversation and we just, we felt like we couldn't do that. Uh, that um, we know our students are going to need as much support as possible um, to acquire the skills at the develop typical developmental levels. We know it's not a typical year and yet we still are deeply passionate about um, opportunity gap and some of the issues that um, we know that many of our students have faced a harder time than others during this pandemic and to reduce the amount of uh, intervention staff doesn't feel like something we could do. We did make a reduction there last year. As you might remember when our budget turned worse with the pandemic, we did make a reduction in intervention and we didn't feel like we could make yet another reduction in, in intervention I think in doing so would be harmful to students' educational futures. Um, we looked at mental health. Um, and at the end of the day, we feel the same way about intervention as we do about mental health. We know our students are going to need, you know, at least as much mental health staff uh, as, as they did in the past, if not more, given the, the harms that the pandemic has had on the well-being of, uh, of our students and families. So again, we, we looked at that and at the end of the day, we, we made a commitment to, as an administrative team, to not be recommending reductions in academic or intervention or well-being. Um, so it didn't leave too many other places to go, uh, to be very blunt with you. Uh, we already cut some, you know, we've, we've, we've cut supplies some years. We cut them last year, curriculum materials at the budget that we passed at the Amherst Elementary School. Um, and, you know, what you'll notice about what teacher supplies are is that they stay the same, uh, but we live in a world where inflation goes up. So in terms of curriculum supplies, uh, particularly at the teacher level, there's, there's a net reduction every year. Um, it doesn't realize in our budget, but their buying power uh, of what we are able to give them doesn't adjust for inflation. I know there was a former school commander member a couple years ago who was shocked. He said, you mean that just the line doesn't go up every year by one point whatever percent? And we're like, nope, it stays exactly the same. Um, so we didn't feel like we could be reducing uh, the funds that staff have to buy the classroom materials that they need um, so they're not digging into their pockets. And I'm going to be honest about this as much as they already are. We know, I know our staff members go above and beyond. I know that they're spending that. I wish that wasn't the case. So, you know, we didn't have there to go. So really we ended up with a choice of one of three things. One is the budget cut that you um, saw presented uh, with the rationale that you heard. Uh, the second one was to, and we've been down this road before in this district, um, to look at instrumental music. And could we push back the start of instrumental music a year and make a reduction. The, the dollar amount would be roughly similar. So instead of starting orchestra in third or band in fourth, we could push that back a year. And we had a lot of debates and discussion about that. But um, at the end of the day, we felt like that might eliminate some students from being able, particularly the students who don't have the opportunity to start an instrument very young and have private lessons. It might eliminate their capacity to continue to play when they hit to middle school and high school. So. Uh, at this point in time, and I can't predict what the future will hold in future budgets, but for this budget cycle, we 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 decided not to recommend uh, a reduction in instrumental music. And the last one is about um, paraeducators who work in the library, you know, and that was another discussion we had. Um, you know, I think one could argue either way in terms of impact and um, out of respect for staff, I won't do that in public right now. Uh, but at the end of the day, we made the decision we made partially because of the programming. Um, and programming needs that we anticipate in terms of literacy um, and the deep, deep correlation between our library programs and literacy. We want students having full access to the library and picking up books and having the experience they haven't had for a very long time uh, next year. It also would have involved a significant number of RIFs um, for um, employees. And so, you know, that was our thinking in a nutshell. Again, just out of respect for, for more, you know, the employees involved, I'm not going to go into greater detail than that, but uh, unless there's a specific question someone in the committee wants, but this is a really painful process. We wish we weren't having the conversations. Uh, we have great people, and this was for us a way to, um, it's not going to eliminate the impact, but minimize the impact um, on students and also on staff members as well. Um, yeah, I can't say that there's no impact, but I think when we were looking at the other things that I just mentioned, um, that was the, the recommendation and the decision that the team came up with. Thanks. Are there other questions? Ms. Spitzer. I just have one very kind of specific question that I think goes to Dr. Slaughter. Um, when I'm looking at, um, for example, 
on the technology line or the art section, um, it's hard to see the cut. And I'm assuming the reason is for the reason um, that was just mentioned where if we were gonna continue with level services, it would be flat, so it's just not as increasing as much as we might've expected. And that's why you don't see necessarily like a, a corresponding cut in, in say the arts um, section of the longer budget document. Right, so so the the items that are in that that last page of the of that document that show the ads and cuts have not been distributed into uh, the line by line. Um, so those you know reductions in FTE and the reductions in in dollars have not been taken out of the lines uh, to date, which is why um, uh, it is a little difficult to sort of track that, um, as you say, because we haven't applied it yet to to what it is. So what those line by line show is really for the level services as we calculated them. And then uh, what you're seeing on that final page will be subtracted from what you see in that line by line. Yeah. And, oh, and I just, oh, no, I was just gonna add, that's the same as every year. We don't reflect the budget cuts in the line by line until the committee votes um, because they're not really cuts yet um, or reductions yet. Um, so, uh, but the, what, what gets published at the end when it's passed by the school committee and the town council uh, in this instance, would be would have those cuts reflected, but we wouldn't do that until the budget's passed by the elected officials. Mr. Demling? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, Dr. Morris, thank you for articulating those additional cuts that you considered. Um, I just want to highlight for everybody who's listening or watching the public, all those cuts are back up for consideration next year if we don't have a level services budget. So this is, this is why, one, I feel like the school committee needs to be willing to make difficult cuts that are primarily enrollment based and so that we can uh, encourage the town council to seriously consider committing to level services. Because, I mean, it's great that we see all the things that we're not cutting, the uh, instrumental music, the mental health, the library of Paris, it's, it's great we're not cutting them this year, you know, but that means that we've saved it for a year. You know, it, it doesn't, it, it's, they are certain they're threatened next year and the year after that and the year after that, unless we can commit to, to level services for the schools, not, not, you know, three point X percent budget every year. That's not what I mean. Um, you know, I, I, you know, repeated ad nauseum that I don't feel like all cuts are level services cuts, but if, if we can show and demonstrate that we are re responsibly dutifully making enrollment based cuts, but we do not want to cut through the bone of services significantly further. I think that's I think that's really the best case we can make for a sustained um, operational budget support from the town council. That's a um, a really good point to sort of make at this point. Is it's not you know after after a budget is approved for FY twenty two, it's not okay. Let's go. Let's continue on our way. We're going to continue to have. And, and look at those those um, endangered species, if you will, um, for um, for future as well. If we don't have the level services, I did receive some questions um, from uh, community members uh, over the weekend regarding some of the other increases. So I think you've answered a lot of the questions, Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter, about sort of where we looked at at cases. But I want to come back more specifically. Um, to the special ed increases, because I think you 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 answered this at a at a really um, general level before. But um, the special ed increases from year over year um, before that one that you know, before uh, the before the cuts adds cuts um, are going up over half a million dollars. And so this, folks in the community have been asking what's driving that. Um, and when I look at it, it's it's really exclusively prim or primarily driven by contracted services and um, out of district uh, tuition. So uh, I think that, that I'm reading that, but if you could sort of give a little bit more information on sort of what's driving and what's behind some of the increases in special ed, that would be helpful. Yep, so uh, Dr. Brady is here and I think she probably could speak uh, in a little more depth than Dr. Slaughter myself um, about um, special ed and some of the increases um, based on student need. Do you mind uh, filling us in, Dr. Brady? Thank you for joining us as well. Sure, sure. Um, thank you for the questions and the interest in special ed. And um, I am aware that um, when people look at the special ed 
um, costs, um, they can be substantial for a district. And um, I think we're fortunate to have a district that kind of honors and respects the education of all of our students, um, even those who may need some more or things differently than um, a student with a typical learning profile. So, um, so and I think when, when you look at our budget, there's, there's a few things that um, really stand out as the reason that you'll see an increase, um, particularly this year um, from last year. So what we have, um, so we also see our students move from sixth to seventh grade. So sometimes the shift is just from Amherst to region. Um, where in districts, when you have, you know, a pre-K through 12, you, you don't see that fluctuation in a budget in the same way as you might see um, between Amherst and region. But what we have been um, seeing increasing in the last um, several years is a change in the level of need of students who are enrolling in our district. Either they're beginning with us at age three or they sometimes are moving in from other places for us. Um, so we've had um, certainly, we, as Dr. Mars said earlier, we have a number of specialized programs which reduce our need to send students to schools outside of our district, um, which is wonderful for our students because they're able to learn alongside their typically developing peers, which we know by research, um, is the best outcome for, for all students. However, there are times that our specialized programs um, don't meet the needs and we have to look elsewhere. We also are seeing students coming in with a host of many other health-related issues and medical issues that require a level of personnel support that is um, more specialized and more intensive than we have had in general in our staffing. So when you see an increase in contracted services, it may be for um, a, an individual student or a couple or several individual students who have needs that in order to um, successfully participate in the school day need some other support with them at that time. Um, the other thing that I think, and, and I believe um, Dr. Slaughter has um, described this from time to time, is that we do have funding from other sources that offsets our special ed budget, but that fluctuates from year to year. So we have what's called circuit breaker, and we submit our claims for um, students who have higher costs um, on an annual basis, but what we get back doesn't apply to that year. It's for a couple years down the road. So sometimes our current needs and our offset from circuit breaker is from a year that maybe the claiming was less. So you, you'll see a more up and down. We also um, have, and it gets a little complex, but school choice students who have IEPs, we have another um, funding source called school claims. And we submit for reimbursement for those students for their IEP related services. Um, those get reimbursed at 100%. That's not the same as um, Circuit Breaker. And I know um, Mr. Demling um, advocates for that on an ongoing basis at the state level. So um, that would be wonderful if that increased at some point, but there's no promises on the horizon for that. Um, so I think those kind of really are some, I, I'm hesitant to go into any more detail because um, sometimes too much detail in special ed becomes identifiable for students. So um, I always stay away from that. But those are really some of the elements that go into what you will see in the fluctuation of a special ed budget. Um, I, I do want to just make one last point and then I will stop kind of going on. You can ask me any questions you would like. Um, other than increases, what we do on an ongoing basis is look at our staffing and our, our numbers of students and the needs of students. So you'll see this year that we were we reduced a special ed teacher um, in the Amherst um, system, um, not because that was a trying to pare down and do less, but when we looked at our students' needs and the programming, we no longer needed that for this year. I can't make you a promise for next year what might be, 
but that's why special ed is always developed based upon the needs of the students um, and, and as much as we can project them as well. So it was kind of long-winded, so I apologize, but it's a big topic. No, that was that was really, really helpful. I think actually you did a, um, gave a really good, concise uh, uh, overview of a complex topic, so thank you. Um, I think one of the things too that that um, I'm going to ask the question. I, I feel like I probably know the answer, but um, I think it'd be good to hear hear um, to hear that in public. Is unlike some other areas of um, of our uh, education that we might be providing in our schools, like technology or art or music, we don't. I mean, I guess it's a stated as a question, we don't have as much flexibility in deciding what we offer or what support we provide. It's defined by the student need. And to your point, the staffing and decisions and, and support services and spending is driven by what the child needs as opposed to, do we want a classroom with 10 kids or, or 20 kids or 25 kids, right? Is that yeah, I can I can give you the the quick answer. It's a Dr. Bradyism, which is uh, the I and IEP is the most important letter because it's about the individualized, right? And it's about the individual student and the individual program and what services do they require um, to have full access to the curriculum. And so um, you can definitely go share more, Dr. Brady. But I think you know I I think that's a line I hear frequently from others. Even Dr. Brady would say you know. Uh, but I think it really summarizes how we approach special education, and I think it acknowledges that we have these things called programs, and even the quote-unquote program uh, for an individual student, two students in the same program, their individual program may look quite different. So if you think of something like Building Blocks, which is a specialized special education program housed at Fort River, that's not to say that two students in Building Blocks, one student may send significantly more time in the gen ed classroom than another student, but their needs align in as much where we can staff it in a way where both get the support they need for full access to the curriculum. So we're not giving services that students don't need, it's really setting up structures so that students can get what they need so that they can fully access the curriculum. Is that fair, Dr. Brady? Sounds perfect, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Yeah, a couple other comment and a question, Dr. Morris. Uh, so one comment, you know, um, you know the, the harsh reality of special education uh, for some parents in, in the state and the country is that um, one way that districts and schools keep their special education costs down, especially for their intensive students, is that they're hostile to providing services for, their, for, the, for the students. You know, you, you discourage the, the service from being offered, you don't inform parents, you take advantage of language barriers. Um, unfortunately, this is not terribly uncommon with charter schools because if a parent doesn't get what they need in a charter school, they go back to the sending district and then the sending district takes care of them. Um, this is obviously an abhorrent, horrific practice, but it happens. Um, I'm thankful that that's not the case here. And so that goes to our legal and moral obligation. Um, you know, on, on the plus side, I wanted to just put a finer point on the, the, this notion of out of district costs. And obviously, you know, we want to do what is best for the student always. And you know, if if a student needs to go out of district in order to get what they need for their education, you know, that we then we we provide that. Um, but um, Dr. Morris, correct me if I'm wrong, we, we have a very high percentage of our students that stay in district compared to other districts. And not only is that the, I think, the ethical thing to do, I mean, my my son benefited from that. And I really appreciated that. So not only is that the, the, the right thing to do for their education, the education of their peers as well, um, but it, it's it's typically the more cost effective. So if, if you're just looking at this from a spreadsheet point of view of how efficient are we at spending our special ed dollars, um, the fact that we have such a high percentage of our special needs kids in district is is a testament to that. Is that, is that a fair statement? It is, yeah. And I think, you know, the challenge for many districts, and, and I want to thank people here before Dr. Brady and myself, is they recognize that. Um, I remember being a first or second year teacher, I think my first year, uh, and then, then superintendent, you know, at Convocation talked about the need to build up our specialized programs within our district. Um, and and some of that was really cost-based, you know, and that's no critique of that individual, but it was it was that the costs were spiraling out of control 
uh, for students um, who are leaving our district. And I think what we found is as the district over the last 20 years has built special education programs within the district that can accommodate and support most, not everyone, but most of our students, that there's not only been some financial positive impact, but also all the other pieces that you mentioned about students staying within the community, uh, not taking very long bus rides. We do not live in the most populous area. There's not um, special ed programs within a 10 mile radius for all of our students. These are, these are pretty far away and that has large impacts and it, it sometimes is forces and it does even within our own district questions about uh, more at the secondary level about residential programs just because the distance is so far. Um, so I think there's a lot of benefits to it. I think where it gets a little complicated, the numbers is that where districts put the costs of at a district student sometimes makes it look like, you know, the costs are in different cost centers, right? Um, so in some districts. So it, it's hard to do apples to apples comparison, um, but we think it's better for students and we do think it's better for the budget as well. Dr. Brady, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that point. No, um, I, I just want to say that I think that one of the things that our community values so much is the input of the community as we're looking at our programs. So our specialized programs might have maintained the same name, um, but the, the staff who are working in there will tell you that the programs have changed routinely year after year based upon the profile of the student as to what are the related service personnel, what is the design of the program. So we're constantly changing things based upon what the student needs are that are making up those grade levels at that time. Um, and I do want to, to just say kind of the one other piece when you talk about the I and the IEP, um, that team, IEP teams who make those decisions, um, one of the things that this district does a great job at is really valuing the partnership of families um, versus I think what you were saying, Mr. Demling, where um, there are some districts that just uh, like drive those IEPs in a way that really silences um, families and intimidates them, I might say. And that's not something that um, we will have happen in this district. Um, I don't think our personnel nor our families and our special ed parent advisory committee, um, we really work very closely with them. They look closely at things, they ask good questions, they help us grow and develop our programming in a way that um, really addresses our community's values of how to educate our students. Thanks. Any more um, further questions either on um, the special ed topic or um, other questions about the, the cuts in the budget overall? Dr. Morris. Yeah, so what I should have started with was the framing is uh, we're asking the committee to vote on uh, the budget tonight. Um, so I should have started with why we're talking about the budget. It's This isn't a hearing. This is uh, looking for a budget vote because the town manager has a budget that actually we are by charter need to have a, a pass budget by Thursday. Uh, and we don't have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow. So I'm hoping that we get a vote on some budget tonight, you know, if, if there's adjustments and more feedback, that's fine. But the, you know, if it's the budget as presented, uh, that's fine too. But that is the context that by charter and the departments need to have a presented budget to the town manager by April 1st. I think, I think we did say that. We just didn't say the, the, the deadline. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I should have been more explicit at the beginning. My apologies. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm just looking at my um, school committee colleagues to um, find out um, are we feeling are, are we feeling like we're ready to to move to a vote or is there further um, discussion questions or adjustments we'd like saw a finger going up on mr Demling. i don't know if you had a question no okay mr harrington did you have anything that you wanted to add or say I, sorry to put you on the spot but oh no problem no well no i mean the only thing that i have have to add to it is that i mean this is this is tough and it's difficult to have any kind of cuts, but like I, I am relieved that we're not looking at like reductions in services and, and these sorts of things. And so it's about where I am, but I am, I feel like I'm ready to move on this tonight, ready to. Do we, um, unlike 
uh, other committees, we yeah, there's there isn't any stipulated language for our motion. Is there? Okay. No, municipal is a little bit easier than regionals. Yeah. Mr. Demling. Uh, I move to approve the FY22 budget for the Amherst School District uh, for $24,386,522 as presented. I'll second that. Moved by Demling and seconded by McDonald. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we move to a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, our next item is um, April return update. So I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure. And so. Um, uh, I will, we've talked a lot about this, so I just, this would be sort of quick updated points. Um, each of our elementary schools, one might be happening right now, actually I think Fort Rivers is happening right now, um, but having a session for families who are returning just for uh, last minute questions, uh, comments about what the return will look like. Um, and, um, you know, so I think, um, I think there's one tonight and I think the other two schools are tomorrow night um, so that the principals and other folks can be in front of families and be able to talk through uh, dismissal procedures, arrival procedures. Those are big topics because we have so many people driving their cars. I want to thank the facilities and transportation department. We have every student on the bus uh, and the only student who will be seated next to another student is if those two students live in the same home. Uh, that is no easy feat. That is not required by the state, but uh, that's the care uh, that our folks put into putting those routes together. Uh, and I was a stickler, so I apologize publicly to Mr. Roy Clark, Ms. Jones, and and uh, and Randy, and Mr. Sibley as well. But uh, it mattered, so we we've successfully kind of kind of been able not we've successfully implemented the system we had originally developed, even though the guidance has changed to be less stringent we're still able to meet those demands. All the bus lists were emailed out yesterday um, to families, so we're in good shape with the transportation. Uh, families do were informed of if there was a change in teacher, uh, whether they stayed remote or in person, so that all went out last Wednesday. Um, so we have classrooms um, all set. All that's done in power school so that people will be ready to go, particularly on remote students on Monday morning when they're gonna be in different classrooms and they'll be in a new Google Classroom for some students. Um, staff members have had an asynchronous day or will have an asynchronous day later this week to get you know, their classroom either virtual or in person ready and collaborate on the transition because we had a significant number of students change um, change classrooms. I think over the weekend we sent an email out to all families just about the updates to the safety protocols that are on our website. The safety protocols have been on our website but um, with the change in guidance our team of nurses uh, went through that and did some updating to safety protocols uh, since it, it was it was raised in public comment, I think it's worth noting um, about contract tracing and notification. We are still following the Department of Public Health and DESE guidance uh, that if there is a positive case, close contacts will have uh, very direct communication about that uh, and all that goes along with being a close contact and potential quarantine. Uh, but the whole school, all staff and families will receive a generic letter that lets them know there was a positive case in their school environment. So there's a very specific communication uh, that involves a phone call from the nursing staff for anyone who's, who's um, suspected of being a close contact after contract tracing occurs and and then everybody does get communication i really think our nurses i want to say it again because they put in and ben you've seen this as well just an incredible amount of work and care into implementing uh, all the different protocols and being great resources for our schools both for staff and for families and robin super in particular uh, who's in the nurse manager role and has been really doing fabulously in terms of shepherding us through uh, ever evolving uh, guidance that we continue to receive. Um, so all of that is on our website. It was all emailed out to families over the weekend. Um, I'm gonna do a fun one. So, you know, we spend so much time talking about health and safety, obviously for a really important reason, but we also don't wanna forget that we wanna make this as a joyous an event for students and staff as possible. I think it, it, it's easy to get lost and I've heard from other superintendents uh, who have been back in person longer than we have. And one of the things they say is, you know, we obviously have to focus on health and safety, but we can't make that the only focus of students returning. 
Um, so something I want to thank W.S. Moreland and Sasha Figueroa. Um, and I, I, think I always call this the wrong thing, but you know, there's those backdrops that you could see where it's behind and you can take a picture in front of it, um, like they'll have it at celebration. So we have them coming for each of our schools. Um, and let's see if I can share all four of them. Um, let's see. Well, you don't, three of them, because Pelham's doesn't relate to um, you. But I think I'm really happy with them. They look great and they're going to be coming in a little later this week. So you can see Crocker Farm and, you know, these are large, you know, five by five foot by seven foot panels with stands so that students can can have their picture taken and be welcome back. Uh, you can see Fort River with their logo and Wildwood as well. And if you're curious about our neighbors in Pelham, I'll just keep on scrolling through so you see the last one as well. Um, but, you know, while that may seem less important than health and safety, I think it's just an artifact of the way we're approaching this is, is, is clearly that we're working hard about health and safety, making sure we're doing all the best practices. Uh, but we're also making sure that we're making it fun. And it has to be both, right? We have to get that right, that balance between, uh, yes, it's not school, quote unquote, as usual, but it's also the joy has to come through. Uh, and I think our teachers who have done the voluntary return have done an outstanding job. I was over at Wildwood a bit today and I've been over since they returned uh, at the beginning of uh, the, towards the end of last week and been at Crocker Farm, so they've been back a little while. And, you know, you see, what you see is students coming back joyous. And I was in a fifth grade classroom last week at Wildwood and uh, Principal Nick asked, you know, what do you like about being back in person? And the hand shot right up. This is their second day back in person. It's Friday, I believe. And so many students had, you know, really interesting things. I mean, there was to the point of one student saying, I, I'm seeing things in 3D. And, you know, that sounds like a silly comment. It wasn't at all meant to be like a silly comment of uh, pre-adolescent. It was like, no, it's like weird to actually see things in 3D. Um, so many people said, uh, you know, I get to see my friends and talk to my friends. But so much of it was around that sense of the community on the second day that that teacher at Wildwood had created already. Uh, most of the students were from his from that classroom, but you know, in all of our in-person classrooms, there's a mix, right? There's some students who are transitioning. So we want to do things that en envelop students in the community feel of both the school as well as the classroom, uh, as well as implementing the health and safety. And I think that balance is just a really important thing. Uh, and what I've heard from other superintendents who went one way or the other is they they, they really express trying to stay um, attuned to the balance that our students need as they return and our staff needs. Uh, as they return to buildings. And that's the way we're approaching it. So I know that was a little just like a fun thing and, and perhaps less serious, but I think it's just, it's an artifact of the way we're approaching it and also the talents of, of some folks who work with me, because I think you all know me well enough to know I could not do those things, either digitally or figure out the company and, you know, all those uh, details. Um, but we want we want there to be artifacts of this. And I think one way to make artifacts is, is that photos do a good job of that. Um, and, you know, to have a specialized photo uh, is something that we're really looking to be able to implement next week and have an artifact of what it felt like in the spring of 2000, 2001, coming back to the building after not being there for many students for over a year. Um, so we think it's really important uh, to approach it with that lens. And um, certainly I'm happy to take any questions, but that's that's sort of my spiel for return to school. We're just thrilled to see the kids, more of them. Sorry, I was on the wrong screen. Mr. Demling. Yeah, thank you for the update uh, and for the contact tracing. So there was, I just wanted to re-clarify for you on, on something you said there. So there, there were some claims made in the press that families may not be notified if there's a positive COVID case in the building unless their child's considered to have been in close contact with the individual who tested positive. Can, I, I, I think I heard you say the opposite, but because it was covered in the press as a claim, could you just re-clarify what you stated there on the contact? tracing and the notifications that parents will receive? Yeah, so anytime there's a positive test of any individual who's been in a school, whether it's student or staff, everyone in that school community, families and um, staff members would be notified that there was a positive case of someone who'd been in the building. And, and this is very similar to all the way back in the fall where we did have a positive, uh, what was believed to be anyway at that point, a positive test at Fort River, right, as students were slated to return. And um, the state has those general let generalized letters. And this is in our contact tracing document on our website that was emailed. The last sentence on that page talks about the communication goes to everyone in that community. So um, it's not just kind of me casually saying it, it's, it's in the documents formally that were drafted and uh, sit on our website as we speak. 
Mr. Harrington. You know, slightly lighter, lighter note. I was going to say the, um, like, I'm, I'm really happy to hear about the, the backdrops and, and, you know, kids having the little selfie backdrop, the little star thing, because personally, I, I think the value of a positive childhood memory is, like, immeasurable, right? And after this insanely abnormal year, or, or year and a half, actually, I mean, I, I think that's, we have to celebrate every little bright and shining light. And that is a huge blaring bright and shiny light that a lot of kids are going to actually enjoy. So I'm, I'm very heartened to hear that after this year. Thank you. Yeah. I'm lucky to work with good people. I will, I will, I will join that, that um, train and, and saying that, I, that just makes warms my heart too, to like, looking forward to seeing those artifacts as you described them, the um, students returning. Um, I, I do wanna circle back to another sort of, um, back to Mr. Demling's comment about the, um, what was reported in the press, the comment about um, uh, the contact tracing um, for students who may not be able to communicate um, adequately or appropriately about sort of who they've been in touch with and, and to what extent um, other adults that are in the school or have been in contact with those that student will be involved in sort of providing contacts for tracing. Yeah, so the contract tracing process really um, tries to balance the, the need and the right of privacy with the need to gather the information from public health. So, uh, you know, if Robin was here, she could describe it probably a little better than me, but essentially the nurses uh, have been trained on this. They've done contract tracing with the town um, for months now, and they have to get to a threshold where they believe they have enough information to make a judgment uh, based on the age of the child, uh, potential disability, uh, other factors that would contribute. That's going to determine how many others need to be involved in the contract tracing kind of investigation, so to speak. And so for students who aren't able to communicate accurately uh, for a whole host of reasons, that's where more people, and particularly more adults, would get involved in the contract tracing. Um, but that's where we trust our nurses who have been trained in this process to make those judgments. Um, there, are, there are professionals, there are experts in this area, um, and they're, you know, the balance of privacy and getting to the bottom of public health, they're not going to sacrifice the public health uh, if they're uncertain on a contract tracing front. They're going to keep on going until they meet the, the threshold by which they're comfortable that that process is complete and they've experienced doing that uh, in a variety of settings as well as the training that they received and support we received from Emma Dragon in the town of Amherst as well. Um, so, you know, I think uh, much like Dr. Brady said before, every case is individual and what they tell me about COVID is that uh, in their experience, every case really is individual, that the number of factors that go into their decision making in that matrix is really large, but certainly uh, an individual student's ability to communicate, especially in elementary school, student's ability to communicate is going to be a factor at the secondary level. Frankly, what other folks find is it's not so much the ability to communicate for most students, it's much more about the willingness to communicate. And that's a different challenge, uh, but for a different committee. So you don't have to manage that one so much tonight. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, any other questions um, regarding the return to school? Not seeing any. Thank you for that that update. Um, moving on to our next item is a uh, update on the MSBA Elementary School Building Project. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so this is this is a truly a brief update. So uh, the good news is because I think I updated you from the MSBA meeting that happened all the way last month, but we are on pace to by we meeting the building committee to um, get to the June MSBA meeting and hire an owner's project manager. Uh, Dwayne Chamble, who works in the Family Center, uh, is uh, on the building committee and he is the school-based rep on the OPM hiring committee. Um, I was involved a little bit in just some feedback on the drafting based on my experience, both in my current job, but also having been on a building committee before and just uh, what potential needs of an OPM are. So I gave my feedback to that process. Uh, Kathy Chain, who is the chair, has been uh, incredibly, uh, and I mean this only in the, the positive way, but dogged about making sure we stay on timeline. So many thanks to, to her, to keeping our group uh, on task and on time, which, you know, isn't always easy. Um, I'm learning a lot from her. She's great. And so 
um, that all the documents, and this is, I think, the maybe the most important thing to note for both for the committee and the public, is every time we think we're done, we submit, for instance, the OPM, the ad that would potentially look for requests for proposal from OPM, it needs to go to MSBA Legal. MSBA Legal invariably, even though we're using their template, finds a couple things for us to fix or questions for us. We then respond, it goes back to MSBA, and that's an iterative process every single time we have a submittal or any, any single time we're um, submitting anything, even if it's not to them, but to the central registry for um, getting bids. And that's just the way the process works for MSBA. Um, so I know it's, it's um, from the outside, it could feel like, why does this take as long as it takes? And their level of detail and project management, uh, the, the support they give us around managing this project is huge, but that also goes with um, delays. So we thought we were done, we used our template, we sent it to them, they came back with multiple questions and feedback to integrate. And that's that that's how they operate. And honestly, that's why they run a very healthy, good organization is they are on top of the large and the small. Um, and if you, if you ever get to, you know, involved, the very, very, what seems to the outside, very uh, minutia details, but for them, it's not small because they've seen where projects have have had troubles when they haven't been um, producing documents that have all their required elements. Um, so next building committee, I believe is a week from tomorrow. Um, we, we meet early in the morning. Um, I think it's 7.45 or 7.30, something like that. I'm looking at Mr. Harrington, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, at that point, we'll get an update um, for how the process is going from the group that is going to be um, looking at the bids and ranking the owner project managers, uh, and then eventually making a recommendation to the full committee for selection. And is there anything I'm missing from that update? Nope. Very thorough. Very thorough. Okay. I don't know if there's any questions. Mr. Demling? I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Harrington and, and Dr. Morris for staying on that committee. Um, I, I watched a lot of it the last time, and uh, man, is that a long slog. <laughs> <laughs> all the way through, you know, and I just hope that um, you don't get burnt, like pace yourself, like don't get burned out. Like I remember like the, the long stretches of just administrative minutia and just trying to get through all that. And it can be not the most scintillating thing in the world sometimes, but you know, thank you for that. It's, and it really does sound like the people in the committee are really committed. Um, Kathy, she, you, she chairs JCPC as well. So I, I know what you mean when she says she's dogged and uh, you know, Dwayne is great. So it's a really great group of people we, we have there, um, you know, thanks to the town manager for his appointment, uh, participation in that process. And, um, you know, thank, thank you for attending all those meetings is all I can say to you and, you and Ben right now. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think the group is also functioning really well as a committee. I mean, I think that's probably the other thing worth noting is that even when we make subcommittees, when we do this work, um, you know, I feel like everyone's really committed to moving forward as expeditiously as we can, as long as we're you know, dotting our I's, crossing our T's, and, and the kind of disbursement of responsibilities, I think, is working out very well. Great. Any other questions or comments? Great. So we'll move on to our next item, which is the um, update on JCPC and the capital plan. Um, so I'm going to look to our JCPC reps, um, Ms. Spitzer or Mr. Demling, to introduce this. Um, I always feel like we're caught off guard here, Ms. Spitzer. Like, like this comes up, and <laughs> I'm expecting somebody else to run it. So, Dr. Morris, I don't know if we have in a convenient place the list of the capital items. Um, uh, if if you're searching around for that, like the, the list of capital proposal items from the school. Um, Dr. Slaughter would be more likely to have it. I see at least his silhouette is still on the call. I don't know if he's literally <laughs> still on the call, but he's probably quicker able to, there he is. I, I can uh, stall for a minute or two. Um, probably but, okay. Um, yeah, so basically we're, we're almost at the end of the JCPC process. Uh, this Thursday, we, we vote the final report. Um, it's been kind of a weird experience for me. I'll just be honest. Um, we, you know, we've in intensively met. I think everybody has been pretty dutiful about it. And, you know, we heard the presentations and we talked a lot about this and that. And then, and in the end, it sounds like, so we haven't voted yet, um, but we're doing it a couple of days. Uh, but based on the discussion last week of, of the draft report, it sounds like the committee is going to essentially support what was originally proposed. Um, 
which even though it is only eight and a half percent capital, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in given the the pain that's going on in the operations budget. Um, I most of my comments were around, hey, can't we shave a little money off of this and 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 shift shift some of the um, financial attention back to to the ops budget? But there wasn't really widespread support for that. Um, in, in terms of the schools, um, there was pretty much, you know, like like every other department support, but th there is some language in our in our report that we're still working on um, that says that if if there is money to be had from the school and town technology um, budgets li uh, lines that, that that could be reallocated to a sustainability line item. So a lot of talk about having a hundred thousand dollars sustainability line item for for various projects um and uh we were just sort of batting language back and forth around about that i didn't i didn't want it just speaking for myself i didn't want to make it too weak so that it could just be dipped into and uh to, to the detriment of the school or the town it needs um given that given that D mr slaughter was one of the only presenters who was kind enough to offer up uh, some place to cut um if if it was needed um, but that's, that's, that's about where we're at. Um, um, Ms. Fitz, I don't know if you had anything to add. No, I think the only other thing that's relevant to the schools is kind of a request that we look into, no surprise, um, finding hybrid or electric vehicles for the, for the van replacements. So it's going to be probably coming, <laughs> coming down the, the pipeline at us. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's been a, it, Good learning experience, good process. Um, don't have much to add, but if anybody has questions, I'm sure Peter or Mr. Demling and I would be happy to, to answer any. Um, I don't have any questions. Mr. Demling. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I kept meaning to ask this one before Dr. Morris. Um, so for accessible playground, Crocker Farm, I presume this means the, the playground in the back um that it, it's a few few fiscal years from now um but i just i just wanted to ask you about it in general i know it's not in the greatest of shape um and it's i'm just looking at the spreadsheet right now real time so and it's not on the plan until fy24 is is there is there anything we could do to kind of shore that place up for for the kids before we we get to fy24 um yeah, I think some of the accessibility challenges are the slope of the hill. There's not like if you if you think about the lower playground at Crocker Farm, there's the accessible path to get there. So I think that's less about just to be blunt. I don't think that's as much about shoring it up as is is providing literal access. Um, so I, I don't want people to get too excited, but that slope is really large, and that's really where I think a lot of the focus is. There may be some equipment that's possible, but a lot of it's creating a, a way to get there for students who have mobility challenges. Um, so, you know, I, I'm happy to think about um, playgrounds in general. I mean, I think, you know, what, what's a little odd is that, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, maybe a little more, both Fort River and Wildwood, and, and a little bit before that, uh, excuse me, both Crocker Farm and Fort River had major playground projects and a little before that Wildwood. And, um, they've lasted well they've done our students they've done our students wonderfully and all three of them are starting to show signs of wear and tear um so i think it might be a broader conversation about how to approach play spaces in general um especially as we see the benefits of like the updated Groff park if any of you have been there um and how much that has transformed that play area um but it, i think it's something that actually within the next couple of years we're gonna have to talk about for all three schools um, because all of them are showing significant signs. And obviously with the building project, maybe we don't have to do as much at two of the schools if we're really going to replace one or more uh, within the next five years, but a Crocker's not going anywhere. So um, I think it's, it's a worthwhile conversation. But I just wanted to clarify that that's really about access and not um, about that much more in terms of the elements of it. Any other uh, questions? No. Okay. And thank you both for 
putting in all the uh, time and, and representing us on the JCPC. Thank you. Um, great, next up is uh, future agenda planning. Um, I can, would you like me to speak to a little bit to this? Yeah, that would be great. So the next meeting we have scheduled, the April meeting is April 13th. Um, although potentially we could also do it April 27th. So I suppose that's a conversation that um, that people could have. But as it stands now, it's April 13th. Uh, we would do an in-person learning up return update, uh, MSBA update. Um, I put on at least tentatively the grants piece that um, Ms. Spitzer talked about. I think at that point in two weeks, we should have more clarity um, about the stimulus funds and how we might want to approach that. I'll have more information about virtual school um, options. And that actually may be worthwhile, depending what I find out next week, um, to have as its own option in terms of uh, for fiscal year 22, um, if the committee and the community are interested in maintaining that option, what that would look like. Um, it would be very different than this year. My understanding, although I'll find out more Monday, is I believe it has to be its own approved school within a district. That's how it formerly was before COVID. Um, so I, I think it's not a decision that like is a casual one. And I don't mean it was casual this year of what virtual school looks like, but we just did it. We didn't, you know, it wasn't like a, an application. It was part of, you know, so I do think that may be something we want to talk about in two weeks uh, because I think the timeline of making a decision on that and applying to the state won't be, we can't do that in August. You know, we'll have to make a decision sooner than that. So those are the topics I had anyway on the that uh, agenda planning sheet. I don't know if there were other topics that folks wanted to add. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I was just thinking about timing and before you said we might need to re meet in two weeks, Dr. Morris, I was I was gonna just throw out there, is it feasible to, to wait until the 27th? Just because I feel like after more than a year, we should probably start to try and claw back a normal meeting schedule. <laughs> um, not not just for our own personal sanity, although that's a nice side benefit, but like for for our you know administrators and, and teachers who have to you know as we've seen show up to these meetings on occasionally um, prepare for them. Um, they're going to be pretty flat out preparing for the return of in person, and I feel like now that we're past the major things of return to in person learning and the budget. It's not that we're we're gonna want for things to talk about as Dr. Morris just itemized. Um, but if it was, um, I mean, I'm 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 happy to meet if if we need to, and that's gonna help your planning out, Dr. Morris. But if it's um, if there are things that we can start to queue up for um, a, a more a more regular schedule, that would be at least something to shoot for. I think. I, I, my head was going there as well, um, and then the question would be: We have a it, this tonight's meeting was one that we added in. Um, so the next meeting after the after the twenty seventh that we have slotted penciled in, I should say, is on the eleventh. So then the question would be, do we move that out? Um, you know, to try to get back to sort of the monthly meeting approach um, cadence. But we don't have to address that right now. Ms. Spitzer. So one thing I'm thinking of when you talk about the virtual school um, question is I think that's two things I'm thinking about. One is, is that a conversation that needs to go across districts? Is it going to be, um, and if so, if there's any advantage to trying to schedule a meeting where it's included in some of the other districts you work for? I, I'm not a big fan of having the huge meetings, but I'm just, the the other thing is that also kind of spans districts is a little bit about the fact that we're going to eventually need to to start working in some meetings where we start talking about the evaluation um and i think maybe that's a conversation i'd be you know can start having offline too um to to start planning that out but um and that's again something that i think might be worthwhile especially because of the overlap this year in in goals that we want to consider creating another joint meeting to i'm not sure when the right timing is i think that's a big to talk about in, in an agenda item um, in the future potentially in a different district but it it does affect the district as well yeah no on the first one um 
uh, I'd love it if we could make applications as a joint district. Um, they generally um, don't allow for that. And I do think in this case, actually, I would be thinking about a virtual school differently at the elementary level than the secondary level. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll leave it there because I don't want to go into the actual item, but I think that there's a need, it might benefit us to have a, a elementary specific conversation about virtual school. Uh, I can imagine Pelham potentially being involved, but I don't think that should be the front end of making a, a joint meeting that way. But I, I think uh, for a whole host of reasons, I think it should be start at least at an Amherst level. Mm -hmm. We do and, have. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say the evaluation thing. I'm happy to follow up offline of what makes sense, Ms. Spitzer. Yeah, uh, we had um, tentatively slotted in um, having the artifacts presentation the second week of June. Well, actually, I guess it's the third week, um, June 15th, and the evaluation on the 29th. That's probably um, compressed overly much. <laughs> um, it's quite ambitious, but um, uh, we can also vote on the instrument. Um, so that's the one right. thing that we review it and we vote on it. And I'm not saying we really need to do all that again, but it's typical. Yeah. But yes, I, I agree with the, the notion that it would be good to start talking about that now so that we're not squeezing that in all in June. Anything else? Um, so we're, we've shifted. We're not meeting on the 13th. We're uh, planning to meet on the tw 27th. Um, and in-person learning return update, MSBA update, grants discussion, virtual school discussion, and question mark on the superintendent evaluation timeline, which we have time to for you, for you folks to uh, talk offline. Anything more? We, um, just uh, just for heads up, um, we had talked about, just so, so folks see what's coming um, down the pike later in May, the May meeting was when we were going to talk about sibling policy for students in specialized programs, um, Crocker Farm long-term capital planning, and 2021-22 preschool planning. So those were sort of tentatively what we've slotted in for May. Mr. Demling? I know this is dependent on another committee, um, but are we still thinking we're going to be able to talk about uh, sixth grade to the to the middle school at the Amherst level, given the sequence of region discussions at first and then the sending districts? That, yeah, um, the region discussion is happening on the 4th, so potentially the Amherst committee could be talking about it on the, or at least having a separate conversation. I'm not sure if the region will be at a decision point after the 4th. Great. Okay. There were two gifts that came in and they, because they just came in late, it didn't make it to the agenda. So, um, I mean, it wasn't reasonably anticipated, but I don't know how the committee feels about that. It could certainly wait, or you could consider them tonight. They were in the packet, however, they were added to the packet. Oh, I didn't download the new packet, but I do have a few warrants to read. So. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize for getting ahead of you. I don't remember the order that we usually do warrants and gifts, but um, I'll read I'll read the warrants and then we can come back on the question on the uh, the gifts. Sorry, I just take a moment to. Okay. I uh, Allison McDonald authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of twenty five thousand nine hundred and eight dollars and forty five cents for the warrant dated April second, twenty twenty one. This includes general fund expenses of $24,257.77, revolving fund expenses of $300, grant fund expenses of $330, behavioral mental, I, I'm assuming that's a fund or is that a grant? I don't know what it, but um, of $842.15, a gift to the school of $178.53, and I signed that today, March 30th. I have two more, sorry. Um, I, Allison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables, the amount of $132,103.77 for a warrant dated March 26, 2021, 
This includes general fund expenses of $119,318.29, grant fund expenses of $875, CARES Act fund of $994.65, behavioral and mental health fund of $6,939.50, a gift to the school of $100, and Article 14 funds of $3,976.33. And I signed that today, March 30th. And one more. I authorized payroll in the amount of $641,116.53, dated March 24th, 2021. And I signed that on March 22nd, 2021. Uh, and now we can uh, consider the gifts if, if the committee is, is amenable to uh, looking at our gifts tonight. Okay. You'd like me to display them? That would be helpful because I don't, I didn't download the packet, sorry. Yep. I'm happy to make the motion because I have them up. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I move that the Amherst School Committee um, accept the following gift from Martha Oliver, number 995988 and 995964 um, to support the Crocker Farm at the principal's discretion in the amount of $20. And I also move to um, that the Amherst School Committee accept a gift from Claudia Donald to of a Selmer alto saxophone, which is a donation with an estimated value of $800. I'll second. I move by Spitzer, seconded by McDonald. Uh, any discussion? We'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Deming? Deming, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously. And we've come to the, look at that, we're 10 minutes early. That never happens. <laughs> um, I will move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Spitzer. There's no discussion. Any roll call vote? Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. We are adjourned. Good night. Good night.